We certainly do not intend to stand by and see people who have lost their jobs also lose their homes. However, it would be preferable in one sense if the banks, the building societies and the lending institutions agreed uh, to suspend payments in cases of genuine hardship. That's what a moratorium act would do in any event. Moratorium doesn't mean that you uh, relieved a responsibility uh, to pay your mortgage debt, but rather whilst you don't have a job, whilst you don't have the financial capacity to repay the instalments, then uh, the necessity to pay is suspended. How do you judge genuine hardship? Uh, it operates first of all by uh, negotiation between the parties, but then uh, it would be some sort of tribunal which would determine which cases are genuine and which are not. Do you think the introduction of legislation of this kind is an admission that we're returning to the days of the 1930s? Well, let's face it, uh, we all hope we're not. Uh, but uh, there's so much uncertainty in Australia at the present time, and may I say, so little leadership at the national level, that if it's demonstrated that people's homes are threatened, that is, their possession of their homes is threatened, then I don't think there's much alternative. Mr Rand was in the north as a guest of honour at the 10th Lion annual mining memorial Lion service held at Freeman's Waterholes. About 150 people attended the short service dedicated to those miners who lost their lives during the past year. Prayers were also offered for the families of the deceased and for those miners suffering injury or ill health as a result of their work. Hope was expressed that the coming year will be the first in the history of the state's mining industry to be accident free. As a lone piper played, representatives from the region's mining organisations paid tribute to their dead colleagues by placing wreaths and flowers on the memorial. After the solemn service, Premier Rand told those present that the state's mining industry was facing hard times and that there was no end in sight to that hardship. He said now more than ever before, there is a strong need within the industry for mateship and community spirit. Mr Morris claims that funds allocated for national highways under the Bicentennial Roads program are shaping up to be billions of dollars short of the upgrading standards promised by the government. He cites figures that indicate in New South Wales alone there will be massive shortfalls in excess of one billion dollars and that inevitably it is the motorists who will pay dearly for the new roads. Mr Morris also believes this shortage will affect, amongst other projects, work on the Sydney to Newcastle freeway. It holds the prospect of some increase in the level of construction of the Sydney Newcastle Expressway. What it doesn't hold, which is more important, is any guarantee from the present government, were they to remain in office, that the highway would be completed. The other thing that's important is it's very, very clear, quite obvious, that the work that's being promised by the federal government cannot possibly be carried out by the amount of money that's going to be available under the bicentenary program. In fact, in New South Wales alone, the work that's promised would cost a billion dollars more to perform than the money that will be available. So that means one of two things. The work's not going to be carried out, or alternatively, the level of federal fuel taxation on motorists is going to substantially increase. Do you believe that the roads program was initially uh, organised in the budget as part of an electioneering campaign? Oh, there's no doubt about that. It's been dressed up. It's the, it's the old National Highways program dressed up in new clothes in an attempt to try and diffuse roads as an issue in the next election, whether it's this year or whether it's next year. If electioneering is a part of the issue, would you hazard a guess as to when the next federal election is likely? Two dates. My guess is uh, November 27 or December the 4th, and yes, I think there will be an election.
uh, laying idle and Uh, we do require a great deal of money to get this project off the ground. The clubhouse over there uh, has no facilities at the present time. There's no seating, no tables, but also we need a great deal of machinery to make this club viable uh, at the present. Jimmy Bowen was the first to fill the canvas last night when Charlie Brown hit the left hand side of the door. Bowen got up to pick the count but he continued with the fight and proceeded to build up a big point score in the fourth, fifth and sixth rounds with good left-right combinations. In the tenth round, Brown was the one that came under severe punishment from Bowen and the referee Joe Reed stepped in and supplied the eight count again. But Brown wasn't finished and again sent Bowen to the canvas. It's a seminar designed for parents, coaches, sports administrators, anyone involved in sport at all. And the objectives of the, of the seminar are to create an awareness that competitive sport really suits the talented child. And we're trying to get a message across to give these normal, as we call it, children, the opportunity to develop their skill and enjoy more participation in sport. In Newcastle in the recent times, you've had some seminars and they haven't been terribly successful regarding Turner. Why do you think this is? Well, it, we're in two minds really about the coaches in Newcastle. We, we don't really understand why they don't want to come along to our seminars. We think maybe they're up to level two. They think they're up to level two and it's a catch-22 situation where they can't do level two until they've done level one. We are providing a service in that all the coaching courses are supposed to be conducted by state organisations. Because they have a problem getting out to all the regions and we've introduced this general principles course to help them attain level one without waiting for their state association to contact them. Who are some of your guest speakers tomorrow night? We've got Helen Hilton from the Softball Association, Eric Harvey is representing basketball, Del Saunders from netball, um, Jim Foley is from the Northern New South Wales Soccer Federation. Who's the other one? I believe uh, Mr Stuart Roach from the Newcastle Herald may speak. Yes, he's the, giving the keynote address. We're looking for something a bit exciting from Stuart. Um, the opening session of day two once again belonged to England as they lost just one wicket for the addition of 101 runs. In the, in the
It looked as though openers Chris Tavare and Graham Fowler were going to push the score along, as Tavare firstly dispatched state spinner Dutchy Holland to the fence. Graham Fowler followed suit with this four, also from the bowling of Holland. One run later though, the leg spinner got revenge, when he had Fowler caught at short forward square by former international Gary Gilmore, for England to be one for 46. Incoming batsman match captain David Gow was put to the test by Holland with some tidy bowling. Later in the session, both Tavare and Gower got on with the job. Before Tavare edged this missed chance off Gilmore's first ball of the morning. Gower played some fine strokes before reaching his 50 just before lunch, leaving the score at 1 for 131 at the break. But shortly after lunch, David Gower was out, bowled Gilmore for 56, with the score at 136. Star Ian Botham did not last long, which disappointed the crowd, and was out for just seven for David Johnston bowled Stephen Haviland. England hit the lead at 2.30pm, when Chris Tavare took the willow to Holland with a big straight hit for six. Then it was four off the very next ball. Derek Randall had come to the crease and looked sharp, but was almost out to a stumping attempt by former state keeper Kerry Thompson. Randall's first four came from medium pacer Tim Tower. When he reached 20, he was caught behind off Gary Gilmore. Keeper Ian Gould had joined Chris Tavare, who posted his 100, which took in excess of five hours, with a four off Northern skipper Michael Hill, who had dropped him when he was in the 30s. And at T, England were four wickets down for 232. standing for president? We have two nominations for the um, presidency, the vacant position, they are namely Neville Lydiard and Jack Winnie, both retiring directors of the rugby league. What about the nominations for the board? For the board we have a total of 15 nominations, four again of the retiring directors are re, have re-nominated, Ted Dawson, Glenn Maloney, Jim Hattam and Jack Winnie. Uh, the new ones in the field are Mr Wayne Kerry, Ted Sharp, Lee Morn, John Geddes, Jack Thomas, Michael Hill, Kevin Lynch, Gary Leo, Gary Daly, Basil O'Brien and John Walker. How many seats are going to be contested? Well, there actually um, there's the presidency seat, of course, there is seven directors. So um, we have at this stage a field of 15 for the um, positions of the seven directors. You'd be very, very happy with the number of nominations? Yes, well, it shows that Rugby League is still uh, right at the forefront and we have uh, a lot of people that are willing to um, move in and um, help assist in the administration of Rugby League. Very encouraging. Graham is... The two ferries are being built for the Urban Transit Authority. Today we went on board the ferry Freshwater which is destined for service on Sydney Harbour. The Freshwater has a crew of five plus a skipper and engineer. The 70 metre ferry can carry up to 1100 passengers. Today final checks were being made on the two Daihatsu diesels which power the ship at a top speed of 18 knots. The Freshwater will be chartered out to do coastal runs as well as regular harbour work. Her twin sister, the Queenscliff, is still in the building stages, but represents the last ship to be built at the dockyard. The Queenscliff uh, is due for launch on the 4th of December and uh, possibly uh, April, May next year. And, uh, is that the last of the shipbuilding for the dockyard? That's the last of the shipbuilding for State Dockyard, unfortunately. After the Queenscliff is completed, more men will be laid off, but none are expected to lose their jobs before Christmas. Some tradesmen have not been allowed to take up the early retirement offer to maintain the ship repair section of the dockyard, one of the few sections still operating at a profit. <laughs> 